we'll start with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll proceed with our our deep dive today and well it's it's we do have to make a deep dive because it's hard to uh, it's hard to really understand what happened in this incident and uh, maybe it's one of the most tragic experiences in scripture because we'll find out how Moses was excluded from entering the promised land but uh, you know it's the word of God so it will always be it we will always see precious lessons coming out of all these narratives so let's give this time to the Lord this time to the Lord Heavenly Father, once more, I want to thank you for your people here gathered to, again, search your face, seek your face and search your word. Because, Lord, we want to know more about you. That's the objective of all these studies. We want to know you so that we can be intimate with you. But uh, we also want to know um, you, your mind and your heart in many matters. Because we know that uh, when we follow accordingly, um, you will be pleased with our lives. And that's what we live for, Lord, to please you and make you happy that you created us. And um, Lord, so we want to commit this time to you once more. We are dependent on your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Because the things of the Spirit can only be spiritually discerned. Thank you for giving that privilege to your people. And uh, once more, Lord, we just want to hear your voice. Take over in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll lead. Whether you're on mute or not, let's uh, recite this together. Today, I am face to face with God. I will study what God plainly says. I will believe what God clearly declares. I will obey whatever God wills. I will stand on the word of God. I will live my life as if the Lord Jesus is coming next month. I will never be the same. Be the same. Jesus name. Amen. As a perfect mindset for studying the word of God. If you notice, I change the words of Jesus Christ coming next month because I, you know, the people who may pop in might think I'm a false prophet. So now. I think that's a more accurate <laughs> sentence, right? I will live my life as if the Lord Jesus is coming next month. Because last Sunday, we learned that if, we, if Christ is coming tonight and we know that, eh, all we need, will really need to do is confess our sins, I guess. But there's no uh, drastic change in our lives. But if we... If we knew that Christ was coming next month, then, you know, if we are wise, we would spend our time only on God's priorities and forget our personal priorities. So with that attitude, you can assess what your priorities are and uh, act accordingly, right? You will realize what is important to do and, what, and, and things that you can, you will be able to cancel because they turn out not to be that important. We live for the kingdom because we were bought with a great price. And we were bought for the purpose of, uh, uh, we were bought out of the slave market of sin. And we have a new owner. It's no longer the sin nature or the law that is our master. But now it is Jesus Christ himself who has set us free from bondage to sin. Okay, so well, well, that's a summary of what we took up last Sunday. Um, today, we're going back to the book of Numbers, and we're still in the, uh, we're still in that desert portion, which uh, comes between Mount Sinai and uh, the Promised Land. But uh, we already learned in the previous chapters that uh, God will not allow this current generation to enter the promised land because of their sin of rebellion. And in the process, we learn that uh, there are sins that God forgives and there are sins that he will not forgive. And uh, it, is a, uh, it is a strong statement, but the biblical precedent uh, proves it, right? Because 
for some sins, God said, all you need to do is offer a lamb or a ram or a bull and God will accept it and forgive. But for some sins, God says you have to stone the sinner to death. So that symbolizes sins that God will not forgive because, because uh, he did not allow any offering for such kind of sin. Okay, now... Uh, where we uh, we yeah well two Sundays ago, we also learned that uh, uh, if you remember Korah's rebellion, um, you know, let's see if you remember that kind of rebellion, Korah is uh, also a Levite, a relative of Moses, but he wanted to gain leader leadership in the in the uh, Exodus to the Promised Land, but uh, unfortunately. He, he wanted a religion of his own opinion. And he also defied the choosing of Moses by God to lead them. And what God did was uh, show us that that's not forgivable because it's a sin of rebellion. And God made the earth swallow up not only Korah, but uh, his whole family, except for a few sons who did not follow Korah, which we which we learned were uh, eventually his descendants were the author of some of the great Psalms in the book of Psalms. Now, let's see. So far, uh, here, here we go again. Uh, on your screen, um, you will see a summary of uh, the chapters that we have gone through before Numbers 20 and the lessons we learned from them. Now, uh, we will skip the uh, succeeding chapters and jump to chapter 20. But meanwhile, um, you know, we don't like to miss out on uh, at least an overview of what they are. Uh, chapter 18 are uh, specific discussions on the concept of first fruits and tithes. <coughs> We, we've discussed that, I think, exhaustively already. Uh, but in this case, God simply wants to emphasize the importance of such an off offering and why they should um, uh, take, I mean, why they are important in the life of God's people in, in kingdom life. And remember, the church today, which we are part of, is an extension of that kingdom. And so the lessons on first fruits, that means we not only give our best to God and we, we not only give what is due him in terms of tithes, but we exercise faith in the fact that it is the first thing we give. It's the first thing we release from what God has given us, even, uh, even not considering if there is any left for us because then that is the act of faith that uh, God desires from us. Um, if we give him the leftovers, faith is no longer involved because you can see exactly, you know, what is yours and what you want to give to God. And normally there's nothing left for God. So there is no faith when we don't practice first fruits and tithing. Then chapter 19 is about the loss of purification and uh, God required this for the Levites who serve in the tabernacle because the requirement of God is if you want to face God, you have to be clean. You have to be righteous. But, and so God says that there are instances where uh, you will be impure and should not face God. That includes uh, touching a dead body and, and other stuff. But the lesson that we already learned from here, and these are just more details, is that uncleanness or impurity harms the priest who wants to serve God and makes him impure. While we learned in the New Testament under the concept of grace, that grace is powerful enough so that when, when uh, in the example of Christ, when Christ touched a leper, in the Old Testament, if a priest touches a leper, then he becomes unclean because he touched something that is unclean. In the New Testament, Christ touched the leper, but instead of Christ getting leprosy, 
the leper gets healed. And that is a contrast um, which highlights what grace means. Grace has power to overrule or to conquer the impure and to make us pure. And that's the reason why when we are in Christ, walking with Christ, we can say that we are, we are pure in heart and ready to face God anytime. Um, the disease in the Old Testament and even in the New normally symbolizes uh, bondage to, uh, to corruption. Yeah, in this case, spiritually bondage to the sin nature. And uh, we learned that Christ sets you free from that bondage because Christ uses the power of grace, his resurrection power to make that possible. Uh, we'll, we'll see more of this as we go into Numbers 20. So before we read uh, Numbers, I'd uh, Numbers 20, I'd like you to know that it has so many... Uh, small narratives put together and this this seems to be this seems to be what's in there basically miriam's retirement that means she dies and then it ends with aaron's aaron's retirement too but between that we have lessons that we can learn so let's uh I, as i see on the screen uh let's read through numbers 20 and then uh, we will discuss after. Okay, we'll start with uh, Ateligaya. Okay. Uh, the death of Miriam. Mm -hmm. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, mm -hmm. came into the wilderness of sin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kaddish. Mm -hmm. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Uh, now there was no water for the congregation and they assembled themselves together <laughs> against Moses and Mary and Aaron. Aaron. And, okay. the, and the people quarreled with Moses and said, would that we had perished when, uh, when our, our brothers perished before the Lord. Okay, uh, next three verses, uh, Ate Imelda. Why sure. did you bring the Lord's community into the desert? That we and our livestock should die here. Why, so here. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines, or pomegranate, and there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Okay, um, Ben and Coney, whoever is. Uh, verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, Take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock before their eyes and it will pour out its waters. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. Uh, so Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. In verse 10, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses in Aaron, <clears throat> Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as a holy, as holy in the sight of the Israelite, you will not bring this community into the land I gave them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. Edom refuses passage. 
Moses sent the messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, you know all the hardship we have met. How our fathers went down to Egypt and we lived in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. Our fathers. And when we cried out... Oh, 16 would be uh, Sydney. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, and when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, you shall not pass through lest I come out with the sword against you. Okay, next let's have uh, uh, Jeremiah and then Oi. So the children of Israel said to him, we will go by the highway and if I or my livestock drink any of your water, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. Then he said, you shall not pass through. So Edom came out again, then with many men and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. 22, 22. to 24. Uh, yes. And they journeyed from Kadesh. And the people of Israel and the whole congregation came to Mount Ur. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron at Mount Ur, on the border of the land of Edom, let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land and I have, that I have given to the people of Israel because you rebelled against my command at the water of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar, his son, and bring them up to Mount Or, and strip, is it? And strip okay. Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar, his son. And Aaron shall be gathered to his people and shall die there. Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up to Mount or in the sight of all the congregation. Okay, might as well. Uh, uh, let's see. I, I think, Melda, can you read the last two verses? Okay. 28, 29. Moses removed Aaron's garments and put them on his son Eleazar, and Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain, and when the whole community learned that Aaron had died, the entire house of Israel mourned for him 30 days. Okay, so that's the word of the Lord for today, and uh, let's go to our normal stuff. Uh, any um, anything that you uh, that strikes you in this entire passage? Like I said, there's so many subjects, right? And uh, yeah. and then you can just pick on any one of them. So Miriam dies. Then there's this rebellion in in, in Meribah. That's the place where they drank of the water. Then there's Moses' sin, and that God basically tells him. Uh, because of what you've done, you cannot enter the promised land. You will not lead these people to the promised land. Mm -hmm. And then Edom's sin, that means they refuse passage to the people of Israel. And finally, Aaron, Aaron's uh, retirement. That means he also dies. And, uh, and, but God also tells Aaron before he dies that uh, he and Moses were guilty of not obeying God and will not enter the promised land. So anything there that strikes you, that's uh, odd, uh, something you like, something you don't like, something that bothers you, or whatever the spirit is trying to, you know, uh, put in your heart the, the to share. That, yeah, the one that I 
I see is that Moses, when he got angry, he did not obey the Lord because okay. he was angry at the people. <laughs> so yeah, I it, think a lesson for me is that yeah, I should not do things when I'm angry. <laughs> so he lost his temper, right? Yeah. So uh, I think a couple of chapters before that, we learned that Moses was the meekest man on earth, right? Yeah. That means he's, he's gentle, he's patient, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, you know, uh, this is the opposite of, of, you know, what he was described to be. And it turned out to be very costly for him. Anyone else? Well, the, the Lord uh, told Moses to speak to the rock. I don't know why he struck the rock twice. <laughs> We are, yeah, that, I think it's because he lost his temper. Now, let's review. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, uh, wait, uh, Connie, uh, what, was, what is peculiar to you about that incident? Uh, because I don't, uh, Mo know. I don't Mo know why. Maybe, maybe Moses did not hear God, God tell him, speak to the rock. Then maybe <laughs> he was impatient. He just <laughs> found the rock. <laughs> I, I think I think actually he showboated a little, you know. He, he he heard God's direction, so he knew that when he spoke to the rock, it would bring forth water. But he was uh -huh. angry with the rebels, so he yelled at them and struck the rock. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's one of those things where I feel like he tested the Lord on that one. Like the Lord told him to do a specific thing. And he's like, oh, okay, God's got my back on this. So he, he spoke in arrogance to the rebels. You know, he, he spoke to, from his anger rather than just bringing forth the water like God said to. Uh -huh. You know, he, so they, he, yeah. he used one of God's miracles for his own point. Uh -huh. So basically what you're saying is uh, almost the same thing, right? He lost his temper. Yeah. He, you know. Forgot his moment. <laughs> yeah, and that's why Atelier Guy is saying that, uh, you know, when I speak to anyone, I have I have to make sure I'm not angry first because <laughs> I might do something that God doesn't want me to do. Yeah, uh, that's a great lesson there. Okay. So, well, you uh, might speak with your words instead of his. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Now uh, is um, I have a question. Uh, do you remember if this is the first or second time? that uh, that uh, water came out of the rock. That is the second time. Well, okay, Ben, what's the first time? Do, you, is, do you remember? That is in Exodus, I think. It yeah, Exodus, Exodus. I think it's Exodus 17, right? Yeah. Ah, there it is, water from the rock. So mm -hmm. Exodus 17. And since this is Exodus, remember the Ten Commandments was was handed down by God in Exodus 20, right? Yeah. So the, this happened before the commandments were handed down by God, correct? Yeah. And what did God ask Moses to do? Yeah. Uh, Strike the rock. Strike the rock. What verse was that? Uh, this is verse 6. Six, verse six. six right? Six. Yeah. Yeah, I was... Try okay, that's, that's right. So that's the first time. God said strike the rock and uh, do you think uh, Moses was too old and he had Alzheimer's so <laughs> instead of speaking to the rock he struck it again <laughs> but, but, but previous to that uh, two things like this uh, uh -huh. in, in verse in verse 8 verse 8 yeah of uh, numbers 20 verse 8 you okay know, Moses take this stuff Ben is suggesting that maybe Moses was confused, you know. God told but Moses to take the staff. I and think then, Moses uh, is getting older now. <laughs> yeah. You know, that makes sense, right? Yeah, you know, I think oh, it's getting older. What's the staff for if uh, that... <laughs> <laughs> See, for him, maybe that is a sign for him. Okay, now do yeah. your stuff. <laughs> so what Ben is saying, after God told Moses to take up the staff, Moses stopped listening to the rest of God's words. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <Let's> go. 
yeah. <laughs> he based it on what the staff was used for. And he remembers that the first time he had to, uh, God ordered him or, or told him to strike the rock. Well, that, that makes some sense, huh? But yeah. nevertheless, God still did not forgive Moses. Well, and one more thing, in, in verse 12. Verse 12. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, he, what, what, what God said is like, you did not trust me enough to honor. We know that the Moses trust God, I would say, uh, for all his experience, it seems uh -huh. to be possible not to trust God. Mm -hmm. Because of the experience he had, he had begun, that is how many years have been with God. Uh -huh. so, not trusting him. And, it's, it's almost inconceivable, huh, Ben? It's like... That it's hard to believe that the most just like lose uh -huh. his temper and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly uh, I mean he was the one God used to create the ten plagues right it's like all the experience that he had with God it's like uh, no God is saying that you don't trust me uh -huh. so I, I I was thinking about that wow this obedience and not trusting it seems to me it's not uh, consistent. Yeah. God. Well, what does that teach us, right? It, it doesn't matter what, how mature we are or how advanced we are in the Christian life. Uh, we still have to watch our steps, right? It's, uh, yeah. Because we can get lost in the moment and then we will do something that we will regret later on. Yeah, just like Moses. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So a good good insight, Ben. <laughs> but that's that's a mystery to me. Yeah, you know, God told him to bring his staff. <laughs> and he just relied on previous experience instead of the new command that God was giving him. Hmm. Uh, it could happen to us, right? It yeah. could happen to us. And I think it tells us that uh, we have to always um Pay attention to fresh revelation, right? Uh, it, it, what it means is, um, you know, we may have a previous experience with God doing things one way, but it doesn't mean to say that that's the way we're going to do it every time. Mm. And so yes. uh, this teaches us to, I mean, teach us because look at the penalty. Yes. The penalty yes. is so, so, uh, too harsh. So, yeah, it's too harsh, yeah, right? Too harsh. So, um, well, uh, maybe part of, uh, or definitely what we will be trying to, to resolve here would be this question. Mm -hmm. Why did Moses deserve such a harsh punishment, right? Now, unless you still have other observations from the other stories like uh, Edom or Aaron. Why did Moses deserve such Aaron's, Aaron's death actually also, uh, uh, you know, catches my attention because it's like he goes up into the mountain knowing that God would take his life. And then uh, there's a transfer of uh, responsibility to his son, Eleazar. And then as soon as the responsibility is transferred, you know, Aaron dies. That's, uh, you know, the, to me, it catches my attention. Uh, all this, what, what was Aaron, what, what must he have been thinking while he was preparing for death? My, my question is, since Moses is really of God, of first of all, he, lo he loves the Lord, and then he made this mistake. I know for sure we're talking that that's harsh for him to be punished that way. Mm -hmm. So, where is God's forgiveness then? Where is God's forgiveness? A good question. If, you know, we say we have a forgiving God. Did Moses ask apology, say sorry to God, 
or he did not. That's the reason why God did not allow him to go to the promised land. So since God said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And I hope that, you know, Moses asked forgiveness to, to God when he hit that rock instead of talk, talking to the rock. I know there's disobedience. Yeah. And, so is, uh, that, is that something that um, unforgivable sin? Oh, I haven't heard that. Oh, not... I I, I think because there was an urgence, uh, I think because there was an urgence to. But what you're saying is um, what, the, the disobedience that Moses displayed was a public one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was an urgence. Uh, yes, and we, we learned in previous uh, lessons that uh, apparently the. The nature of the unforgivable sins are normally always public because I believe it's like shaming God in yeah. public, or shaming yeah. the name of God. And God Himself said that you, yeah, you did not show me as holy in the eyes of the people. So, yeah. um, oh my goodness, huh? after all the good things He has done. Yeah. So, one mistake, it's, it's all gone. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, it's like uh, I have an illustration. I, you know, definitely I believe that Moses was forgiven, and I definitely I'm sure. I mean, if you remember the transfiguration in the gospel when Christ went up the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he had a meeting with Moses and Elijah. Remember that? Yeah. So that means. Moses is definitely with God. Forgiven. You know, he's, uh, he's forgiven. So we have to interpret this in that light. Okay? Yeah. He was, he was forgiven, but he was deprived of the promised land. Which for the Christian represents the abundant life. Right? But, uh, in this case, God seemed to be very strict about what was happening. So uh, to answer Oi's question, uh, I, I don't doubt that Moses was forgiven, but uh, it is pretty evident from the story that whatever Moses' sin was, it was a big deal with God. Yeah. In fact, uh, fast forward to King Saul, King Saul did the same mistake, right? And... Uh, the kingdom was taken away from him and given to David. It's, it's almost the same kind of mistake. I, I, so, think, uh, I think Moses really snapped because he, uh, he strike the uh, rock twice. Uh -huh. Because he's really, uh, I would say, lost his temper and he's so angry. Mm -hmm. uh, angry with the people of Israel. Yeah. Because he snapped in that, in that moment. Because if not, maybe he just like, maybe strike once and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> he was really angry. That's why it was twice. Huh? Yeah, because of that, uh, twice he struck it. So meaning he's really angry at the time. Uh -huh. um, so definitely everybody agrees that uh, Moses lost his temper. And, and the reason we learn from this is, uh, you know, even when you lose your temper for good motives, uh, it's no excuse to disobey God, yeah. right? We we cannot do anything like Ateligaya uh, example a while ago that will make us regret, you know, whatever we will do when we are in a uh, in a fit of anger. Well, it no, and the, and one more thing. thing, maybe because. Of his position, that's why the uh, what you call this the punishment is so harsh because of his position. Oh, that's a good that's a good insight, Anna. You know, uh, he is in a leadership position. In fact, yeah. he's the yeah. law giver, right? Uh -huh, and yeah. he's the deliverer from slavery to Egypt. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that's why that's why God 
uh, it was a big thing for God. Now, I think one thing that we should also realize that uh, when we read the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, the people in this story did not yet have a Bible. Well, they, they already had the Ten Commandments, right? But the fact that they don't have a Bible me, means to, it basically tells us that the Holy Spirit was still in the process of composing the revelation of God for us, right? Mm -hmm. So in that particular uh, context, God is very strict with his people because he wants to, he wants to uh, reveal to us his, uh, uh, I mean, he wants to reveal to us uh, who he is, first of all, what his will is, what his plan is, and he doesn't want anyone, any man, not even Moses, to uh, what do you call it? distort the revelation that he wants to give. Okay, so um, I uh, that that's my take on why God was so harsh with Moses. But regardless, uh, we can learn a few things from this experience, right? Uh, the Let's look at, uh, you know, again, we're still exploring why Moses deserved such a harsh punishment. Uh, part of it, I believe, is, uh, as, uh, you know, part of it is Moses' fault. But I think part of it is also how God, uh, what they call that, how God basically uh, transforms the mistake into another revelation for us. Because remember, he's still revealing his, himself progressively to us. And uh, including his redemption plan, including his kingdom plan. Because remember, uh, God's purpose for all of this is to build his kingdom. And he's mm -hmm. just, he started with the nation of Israel to be a prototype of his kingdom, the kingdom he wants to build, the kingdom of God. And we all know that the church today is an extension of that kingdom. That is why we can claim the same privileges and promises that he gave to Israel. Because we are the continuation of that project. And not only that, we are the completion of that project. We, the, the church completes the project of God building his kingdom. But of course, uh, the, the, you know, Christ is not coming yet because... Paul said, God is giving time for the fullness of the Gentiles to be fulfilled. That means God is still bringing people from the Gentiles into his kingdom. And then Paul continues to say that after the fullness of the Gentiles is fulfilled, then God will go back to Israel and bring back the remnant to himself. So that's basically the plan of God. And... Uh, here we see uh, the seeds, the, the starting point of that revelation plan. And I believe that's why God was so strict with the people uh, in this narrative because they still did not have complete revelation. So I think we all agree that uh, the foundation of the punishment for Moses is disobedience. But uh, let's see how bad that sin was, you know, because sometimes we take disobedience for granted. But let's see how bad it is knowing the, the history of uh, what happened to Moses. If you remember Numbers 12, Miriam challenged the leadership of Moses, remember? Yeah. Miriam said, hey, why can't I share the leadership? I'm a prophetess. Which was correct, you know. Miriam was actually one of the first prophets in scripture. And uh, she happened to be female. But what was God's response? Do you remember? No. Before she gave, before she punished Miriam with leprosy, what did God say? It's about uh, direct, direct revelation. To uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, amen. Amen. God said with prophets... I speak to them in dreams, but with Moses, I speak to him face to face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So basically God is saying with prophets, I give them my revelation, but they have to interpret it. You know, they have to interpret the dream or the vision or whatever. And so it's not as clear as what he gives to Moses. What he, because he's speaking face to face to Moses, he gives him his declared will. And there's, there's little question about, about whether it's clear or not. It, it, the declared word of God has more clarity than symbols and dreams and visions. So we learned that, right? And we use the declared word of God to interpret the, un, the less clearer portions of scripture, you know, which, in, which includes uh, the dreams and, and the symbolism and everything. Not the other way around, because uh, many people are so engrossed with symbolisms and many times they use this to, uh, to interpret God's word and then they begin to contradict the clearer words of scripture of God. So, so we learned that. Now, having learned that, and Moses was there at the thick of it, that God spoke to him face to face and there was no question about what God wanted him to do. In Numbers 20, in spite of the fact that God's instruction was clear, Moses violated, right? Mm -hmm. So I believe the harsh punishment of Moses was just to emphasize the importance of disobedience against the clear declared word of God, which is a big lesson for us, right? Yep. We need to know, I mean, we have to obey the clear commands or the clear instructions of God. And, uh, okay, uh, you know, I think God basically is saying that, uh, you know, if, if uh, what you read are, needs to be interpreted before you can understand it, okay, you may have an excuse when you are not exactly obeying me, but how about the explicitly clear declared words of God? It seems that God is saying here, there's no more excuse. There's no excuse if you violate that. If there's no excuse if you disobey that. Very important, right? Yeah. So we, we apply it to ourselves today. And what do we see? We have full revelation. We know what first fruits are. We know what, what tithes are. We know what uh, slavery to sin is. We know what slavery to righteousness is. We know what being dead to sin and alive to God is. And so, you know, these are, these are clear words that... Uh, don't necessarily have to be interpreted so much to understand. And all that is left to us is just to uh, pattern our lifestyle and our mindset and our heart to be aligned with God's design for us. Because we are his new creation. We are, a new, we are his new creation. We were bought with a price. We have the Holy Spirit, which is which is the means by which we experience grace. We experience the power of the resurrection. So these are clear, right? But many times, even I myself, you know, I, I catch myself violating what is clear. And that is the time that we just need to immediately get right with God so that we can go on with our, our walk with him. Any any uh, comments so far? Any questions? Okay, that's that's. I think that's what's that? Uh, this water of Meribah. Oh, that the title, the title of that. The, yes. This water. This was the water of Meribah. Uh, basically, this is the water that uh, burst out of the rock when Moses uh, struck it. So that's why they. Uh, and then it was called waters of Meribah later because. That means God actually provided <laughs> almost a lake, maybe, for Ooh. them to drink. From. Okay, now, let's see. Uh, knowing that uh, revelation is not complete, uh, there are, God is using analogies or, uh, you know, more technically, we call them typologies. And we got this already in previous lessons, right? One typology is Egypt represents, the slavery to Egypt represents the Christian's 
slavery to sin. Mm -hmm. Right? And then Moses delivers them out of that and goes into the desert, the Exodus. And we also learn that the Exodus journey uh, represents the, the Christian's status where he is wrestling between slavery to sin and slavery to righteousness. And this is, uh, this is illustrated, or not illustrated, but, but uh, discussed by Paul almost exhaustively in Romans chapter 7. Because in Romans 7, said, or said, Paul says, saying, I want to do what is right, but I do the opposite. And then there are things that I should not do, but I do them anyway. Mm -hmm. Because that's the state where a Christian is still wrestling between slavery to the sin nature, the old self, and slavery to God, which is our new master. So that's the, that's the uh, typology of the desert experience. And then we also learn that the promised land is a type of the abundant life that Christ promised. And what is the abundant life? It is the state where we have fully conquered the sin nature. It's not heaven. It's just, uh, it's heaven on earth. Because we have finally realized the power of the resurrection is in us because of the Holy Spirit. It empowers us to be free from bondage to sin. Now, what people don't realize uh, when we talk about bondage to sin, when God when Christ frees us from bondage to sin, it doesn't mean to say that the sin nature has disappeared. No, it's still there. The only difference is it doesn't have a tight hold on you anymore. It's no longer your master. You're now free to follow the heart of Christ and to be Christ-like, to have the fruit of the Spirit and all these things. So sometimes we, that's, that's where much of the confusion lies. People think that freedom from the bondage of sin means that that sin nature has disappeared. No, it's there. It's very real. The only difference is because you have the power of the resurrection, you have the power to conquer it moment by moment daily in your life. And, uh, you know, that's the beauty of uh, actually learning the book of Romans in that light. But the beauty of the Torah, the narratives, is it, it's the illustrations, it's the pictures that will clarify what the New Testament is declaring. So uh, let's see. Knowing that that's a typology, here's one typology that is important in, in, this, in the sin of Moses. Uh, so like I said, uh, you know, the, the punishment of Moses is partially because of his fault. But the other reason is God using it to be a type of, of the Christian life, which we will learn later on in the New Testament. Here, uh, Moses represents a type of the law because he's the lawgiver, right? And then Joshua, remember, it is, it is in the end of, uh, at the end of the book of Numbers, Moses will now give the leadership to Joshua, who will lead Israel to the promised land. Now, Joshua is a type of Christ. And uh, incidentally, Joshua and Jesus come from the same Hebrew word, Yeshua. You know, Joshua is the English translation of Yeshua. And uh, Jesus is, from, is the translation of the Greek. In Greek, uh, Joshua is Jesus. And we translate it as Jesus. So it's a great, uh, it's a great, Typology, and I think the Holy Spirit and God actually intend, I mean, uh, what they call that, uh, mm. intentionally, intentionally make that happen. And then the promised land is a type of the abundant life. So what, what does this, how does this typology, number one, relate to each other? It illustrates uh, the heart, our, our relationship with God in terms of the condition of our heart and mind. Uh, we should realize that the law will never be a means for us to achieve the abundant life. It will be Christ. It's only Christ. 
It's only grace and Christ that will lead us into the abundant life. That's why Christ promised, you shall have life and shall have it abundantly. Abundantly. Mm -hmm. So that means that means that we don't we don't gain the abundant life by working for it. We gain the abundant life by just trusting Christ to bring yeah. us there. That means we have to submit to the Holy Spirit. We have to submit to, to the control of the Holy Spirit so that He is free to transform us and uh, and 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 develop in us the divine nature. So the abundant life is the experience of the divine nature. Egypt is the experience of the human nature, of sinful nature. And the Exodus is an experience where you're still wrestling as to who controls you. So that's one good typology that we can get, which God used, uh, God used Moses' sin to illustrate that. And then the other one is, uh, it's about the water, right? Um, this time it's a, it still describes our relationship with God, but it explores the concept of dependence. So the rock is a type of Christ, right? You, you know, many times we know that Christ is the rock of our salvation. And then striking the rock is a type of the suffering of Christ. You know, he suffered and died for us. And then uh, speaking to the rock is a type of prayer and conversation because, you know, talking to the rock is, is, is like communicating. And then the water of life uh, or the water that gushed out of the rock represents the water of life that Christ gives, which is the power of grace. Now let's, let's relate that together. Uh, the first time in Exodus 17, uh, God instructed Moses to strike the rock. Remember, that experience was between Egypt and the law, right? Mm -hmm. So it is part of the deliverance from Egypt. That Christ, it's, it's, it's part of our deliverance from, from the penalty of sin that Christ had to suffer and die for us. And that's the symbolism of Exodus 17. So, so Moses had to strike the rock in order to get water. So Christ had to die in order to open the possibility for us to have the water of life. Remember the, remember the woman at the well? Christ yeah. said, you know, if I give you the water that I have, you will never thirst. Right? Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, Christ had to suffer and die first for our sins in order to open that possibility to us. And then the second time was after the law, right? Numbers 20 is way after Exodus 20 where the law was given. And God instructed Moses to speak to the rock. So the first time the rock had Christ had to suffer in order to open the possibility for us to get living water. And but after the law, uh, I think God is trying to say that we just need to be in constant conversation with God, in constant dependence on God, in order to have the water of life continuously. And not only that, we want to have a fresh outpouring of that water in our life every day, every moment. Right? And the way to do it after deliverance after the law is to just pray you know go to to show our dependence on god for him to share you know that life with us and then again you have the water of life and this is a good verse john 7 38 let's go to that this is christ's words whoever believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, right? And that's the water of life. That's, that's the power of grace given to us by the Holy Spirit, right? So that we have a continuous, fresh supply 
of resurrection power in our lives. So out of the out of some bad thing, because God was still in the process of revealing himself progressively, out of the mistakes of human nature, like Moses did, God brings out valuable lessons for us, which he finally discusses in the New Testament. See, the, uh, much of the difference between the old and the new is the New Testament gives discussions on spiritual subjects. Well, the Old Testament mostly gives pictures, illustrations, analogies. Because during that time, there was no Bible yet. You know, Revelation was not complete. But God made sure that the illustrations are in sync with the discussions and vice versa. The discussions of the new are in sync with the old. And that's how we should interpret the New Testament. The New Testament interpretations we get from the discussions should never contradict the Old Testament. Because Christ himself said that the word of God is the Old Testament. Right? It's, just, uh, it's just the church, our early church fathers, that basically added the New Testament to the uh, complete revelation of God. That means uh, that means that these books were canonized by the church. But if you strictly looked at Christ saying, uh, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, not one period or comma will pass away until everything is fulfilled. You know, Christ was referring to the law and the prophets, which is our Old Testament. But in the Gospels, Christ also said that heaven and earth will pass away but my words will go on forever. So Christ basically authenticates his teachings in the Gospels. And that's one of the reasons why it was easy to, to uh, include the Gospels in the full revelation of God. Now, but those are other subjects that we will take later on. But for now, the, we'll see the importance of types and typology in the Old Testament that brings more clarity to our understanding of the discussions in the New. So initially when, 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 what do you call this? When I was first reading Dead to Sin, Alive to Christ, uh, that my thinking about sin was the acts of sin, dead to acts of sin. But then, you know, i finally opened up to me that uh, Paul was talking about the sin nature. And that seems to be very clear in Romans 7. Because the, uh, the sin nature responds to the law by violating it. <laughs> the natural tendency of the sin nature is to violate the law. And so Paul was saying, you know, you have to now be aware that you can either be a slave to the sin nature or a slave to, to righteousness because you are a partaker of the divine nature. Any questions so far? Ah, this was, actually this was Pastor Sani's sermon this morning and I'm taking from it. He said to remember the lesson from Numbers 20 our cue is to just three things. We need to look out, look in, and then look up. Look out is, you know, if it's you look out that you obey God's declared word. Look in means you search your heart. Are you still depending on self-effort to get to the abundant life? Or are you depending on Christ to bring you there with the power of the Holy Spirit? And then look up is your, it's, when you look up to somebody, basically it's an expression of dependence, right? And so uh, that's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. That means after we have de been delivered from bondage or from, from the penalty of sin, we have to constantly show our dependence on Christ 
by making conversation with him as often as we can pray without ceasing in order to have a fresh supply of the water of life and a continuous supply and that water of life is basically the power of grace given to us by the holy spirit resurrection power every time we have every time we mention power of grace paul actually means the power of the resurrection that raised christ from the dead because it was the holy spirit according to paul that raised christ from the dead any uh, <laughs> any reflections that you want to add so the harshness of the punishment of moses is not so much because it's an unforgivable sin but it's more because god is progressively reve revealing his truths to us and he does not like the mistakes of humans to distort those truths and so because of that you know the mistakes even bring out the clarity of his new covenant plan now the that's not necessarily true maybe with cora <laughs> and the uh but then we we saw that we got lessons from it too right because uh, apparently cora and uh, the sabbath breaker they were they were not forgiven so uh god has a purpose for each narrative narrative i think god gave up moses opportunity to just see the promised land but never been there oh yeah am i right yes yes you're right so, yeah he he brought uh, just before israel uh, entered the promised land and he transferred leadership to joshua god brought him to this high mountain yeah. so that he could at least see he can see the what it looked like the promised land now the lesson i guess there uh, when we reach that point is for us as christians let us not be satisfied with just seeing the abundant life but actually experiencing it yeah yeah at least god gave him you know a what a preview just yes. a, glimpse, a glimpse of the promised land yes which confirms that moses did not commit an unforgivable sin Mm -hmm. you know yeah you know basically god just uh well god still gave him the consequence of disobedience but then um oh, it seems like it's a big deal at that time because he wasn't he wasn't uh, given the privilege to enter the promised land but the fact that god at least gave him a view of it you know means to say that god still honored moses to the end how are we going to compare to uh, who is the one that denied Christ when the uh, Peter? Peter? It's public also that you know he denied Christ. Mm -hmm. And Judas? Yeah. Betrayal. Judas was betrayal. Well, mm -hmm. Judas was public betrayal. Uh, Peter was public denial but uh but, i think uh, the difference the between difference the two between is the two uh, is uh, peter's denial was uh, could be classified under the uh, unintentional sin remember that we learned in uh, yes. numbers was it 16 i forgot where's that out, it, it out of fear That's yeah I'm... and remember we we tried to explain unintentional in this way uh every sin is apparently intentional right every sin is uh, something we we actually did you know and but unintentional i think is when your your basic heart condition is wanting to please god but then it's you okay. your humanity makes you fall so peter, peter was actually loyal to christ but under pressure he caved in yeah so, uh, that's it's, public it, yeah yeah but uh, apparently it looks like it's part of the un unintentional sin classification in the book of numbers 
So it's like, um, it's oh, like when, you, when you hurt somebody, right? When you hurt somebody, you say, oh, I, I, it was not my intention. But you did it. So but it's you, something like that. But the, you slap you slap the person already. And yeah, you yeah. Say, but, in, but in Tagalog, Peter, go ahead. Well, I was going to say the the whole thing about Peter's sin. It you know it's like the lying that David did. Peter Peter wasn't denying Christ's message or or rebelling. He he simply wanted to live when confronted by those people. You know, he knew that if he had said something, you know, his fear told him he would die there. Yeah. And, you know, so he sinned in fear, not rebellion. Yes. Not but you mind. have to add the element that Peter was confused. Mm -hmm. In his mind, this is the Messiah. And now, how come He's, he seems to be defeated, you know? And the, the difference, I think, there is it's not mm -hmm. disobedience. God did not instruct him for anything but it's just what you're saying is unintentional. Mm -hmm. Not like Moses, it's totally different. He has a choice because it was already the master who's talking to him directly, but still that he disobeyed and disrespected the God publicly. So, I mean, as, as, as a Christian, of course, you know, the image of God there is already being damaged. That's, that's what I'm, you know, my comparison. Okay. And to Judas, well, that's intention. That is no. really, you know, he planned for that. It's premeditated. He planned it for a long time. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, my, my whole thing about Peter is he, he denied Christ to non-believers. You know, he denied knowing Christ. He didn't deny Christ or his teachings. He just said, I didn't know him. I wasn't there, man. There. You know? <laughs> like I said, he was confused and under pressure. So sure. I believe it is it can be classified as an unintentional sin. Yeah. In Moses' case, I think his temper. Yeah. You know, that's where he made a mistake. So in one sense, uh, it's unintentional. It's just done in a fit of anger. But the lesson there is whether your motive was good or bad, if you do something that violates God's command, there are consequences. You're forgiven, but there will always be consequences. Look at David. David and Bathsheba, you know. God forgave David, but there were consequences. Yeah. So, so what, what's the reason why Moses was angry? Uh, was, he was he pressured or was he... Uh, doesn't like these people to be provided with water. I am just curious. <laughs> what, what's in her? He's in his heart that you know derive him to do that. Well, they were so they were so far advanced, and again, I would say the crowd was throwing up the same complaints. You should have left us in Egypt. We were happy there. There's nothing here. We're yeah. gonna die. Grumbling, you know, complaining. Like third time, yeah. In over over the course of you know a couple of decades, it's like really. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> true. So I, think, I think it's his you know he's angry to the people, but it's mm -hmm. just transference. You know, it's not supposed. Yeah. To yeah. Be responding in, ta to that in Tagalog, we always say paulit ulit. No, in Tagalog, na inis si Moses. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's like uh, he lost patience because it's the same thing over and over again. You know. Yeah. So I would say in the in the uh, in the context of the unintentional and intentional sin, this would be classified as unintentional, because Moses still wanted to please God, but he was just so mad at the people uh -huh. that he he made a mistake in his yeah. humanness. And, and that's why it's very, it's very good to see all these illustrations because the word unintentional in the Hebrew, unintentional sin, is a translation into English. So it's not entirely what we, how we understand the English. In the Hebrew, it is more robust. You know? It's like, uh, yes, it's intentional, but that wasn't really your heart. Your heart was was not to do it, but you made a mistake. Mm. 
right? So that classifies an intent, while Judas is really premeditated rebellion. Yeah, was planned. <clears throat> Which was the sin of Korah. And he, Korah even, you know, looked for 250 elders to back him up. Uh, that was planned, that was uh, rebellion. Mm. So how are we going to apply that in our application, our life, in our Christian yeah. Yeah, the, the, Good question. the preaching of uh, Pastor Tiff earlier, Who's we them? need to be wise, you know, mm. uh, be gentle and patient and listen intently to the, to the words of God. To the voice to, of God. You yeah. know, to the voice of God. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah because, uh, you know, I, I took a note here, you know, and I think Moses uh, was able to... Um, do some of them, but uh, you know, he was not peaceable, he was not gentle to the people, <laughs> yeah. and then he was not submissive to the word of the Lord, mm -hmm. the instruction, you know, and then he was not merciful to the people because he was so angry with them. So he, you know, he was not able to be wise. Mm -hmm. his, his wisdom is partial. <laughs> yeah. So one yeah. lesson is we have to be wise, right? Yeah. Well, if, if you also notice, I think Moses was already angry before God told him to yeah. speak to the rock. So, mm -hmm. so he just made that an avenue to release his anger by striking the rock when, yeah. when they. But it's just so sad because, uh, you know, after all that effort and everything he did promised land yeah it's like uh, there's a good illustration for that and uh, th that's one lesson so the first lesson is we need to have wisdom we're answering your question Oye. the second lesson is uh, let's look at physical illustration you may be eating healthy or your, all your life but then you begin to you, you drink one dose of poison <laughs> What does that do to you? So it, it yeah, negates yeah. all the good things you did because you took something. Poison would be a symbol for sin, right? Or mm -hmm. So it's just like if you are doing a lot of good things, one big mistake, it's ruined everything. Could be, yeah. Could be. Uh, I think the biggest lesson here is even if your motives are good or not, consequences will follow. Yeah. So the Lord's still gracious today because most of us were not following the Ten Commandments, but He is not striking us to die and to death. God forgives, but consequences remain. Yeah. Okay. Especially for His people today, right? Yeah. God, God knows that we're either in the desert or wanting to go back to Egypt. <laughs> And so uh, his grace uh, is the one that uh, continues to be patient with us. So after all of that, how's the promised land? Promised land for Moses or? Yeah, for, for Moses. How does it look? Yeah. Well, he, well, basically God, God made that an illustration of the consequences that could happen. Even if you have all this hard work of good good works but then uh, commit a sin or commit disobedience to god so it, it teaches us to be on our toes when it comes to obedience i guess that's the lesson here like you said god forgives but uh, god the, still makes the consequences continue You so let you live the light, your life by your choices. Yes. Yeah. The good thing about that is God gives us a lot of control over our future, right? We learned that at the end of Deuteronomy where God puts, makes Israel choose between obedience and disobedience. For obedience, he gives rewards. For disobedience, he uh, gives curses, actually. There, and if you look at the end of Deuter Deuteronomy, as we shall see later on, there are more, I think there are more verses on curses 
than there are on blessings. Oh, curses well. on curses. Yeah, yeah. So uh, God emphasizes uh, how much He hates sin. Right. So I guess those are the lessons here. It's not keeping our nose clean. Remember, we were not talking here about following the Ten Commandments or keeping our nose. We're, we always talk about surrender to God, submission to God, dependence. So there's really no work. These are all acts of faith. Surrender is an act of faith. Submission is an act of faith. Um, right? Dependence is an act of faith. These are not works. While the works that uh, Paul is actually against is try to obey the Ten Commandments, try to you know, read your Bible at four in the morning, try to make your devotions last one or two hours, pray for at least 30 minutes. These are all rules. These are all works. Because everything you do should spring forth from your love of God and your dependence on Him and your submission to Him. Then these rules, these laws, instead of being a burden, they become a privilege. And then you, I think, I think Pastor Tip mentioned it. It becomes an adventure. <laughs> Not right, it's an adventure and it's no longer a ceremony, but they're the same thing. Only difference is the heart and the mindset are different. When it is of faith, it's an adventure, when it is works, it's burdensome, it's boring, right? It's self effort, yes, yeah. So, uh, as people of God, as cross culture, let's be conscious of that. Because God may be using us to transfer these truths, this, the things we have learned to our Christian friends and neighbors. Because not many understand it that way. You know? In fact, uh, unintentionally, this is what happens. You know, somebody shares Christ with somebody. Say, oh, you, you have this personal relation of God. It comes by faith. Faith in the death, resurrection, finished work of Christ. So just receive Jesus Christ. That's all. And then after the person receives Christ, unintentionally, okay, now you have to read your Bible. You have to pray. You have to go to church. <laughs> you know, without saying, unintentionally, you're saying, now you have to work. That's not the way it should be. You know, when... Actually, what you should, the starting point for Christian growth is always love the Lord. Great commandment. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That is the starting point. And then I believe personally Amen. that when that is your, the state of your heart, all of a sudden you're hungry to yeah. read the word. You're hungry to study. And then you find out that there are so many promises that you can claim. You're hungry now for for prayer to spend time with God you know, to make this real in your experience yeah. but it's it's an adventure it's no longer a set of ceremonies or rituals that you have to perform in order mm. to please God big difference we live by faith right yeah we are saved by faith we mature by faith mature by faith we will be glorified by faith so it works Works really has no uh, has no space to occupy when it is faith that uh, occupies our lives. Faith working through love, right? And that phrase came from was it James or uh, John? We should have faith working through James. love. Who hit? Do you remember? I'm thinking James, but... I think, yeah, it could be. But we can always go to Bible Gateway and, and find that. Right? So. James said faith without works is dead. <laughs> John said love. Yeah, maybe faith working through love. Yeah. yeah. Any other insights before we close?
Well, it's a good conversation. Well, at Ligaya had uh, so many insights. Uh, uh, ben, you know, I'm surprised Ben all of a sudden, you know, comes out of his shell and give sharing with us so many observations, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, it, it made me think, you know, yeah, Moses must old. Yeah, he must have, you know, bring your staff. So Moses thought, yeah, I'm going to strike this rock again, you know. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, did, I, did, uh, I didn't notice that when I was reading it. But yeah, you know, it's possible. <laughs> but at least, you know, God always uses this uh, for good. And we learn from it. Um, good. Yes, Ben. Uh, can you say uh, uh, spirituality and righteousness are two different things? Spirituality and righteousness. It's two different things. Okay, how would you explain that, Ben? I mean, how would, how would you explain each? Spirituality is all discipline, mm -hmm. and righteousness mm -hmm. is true faith. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's biblical because what we receive from God is the righteousness that comes through faith. Amen. You know, and spirituality is more of a philosophical idea. And uh, most of philosophy is self-effort, right? In order to attain this level of spirituality, you have to do this, do this, do this. You know, even yoga is like that, right? <laughs> when it becomes a religion. Good insight, Ben. Thank you. Spirituality is self-effort. Righteousness comes by faith. Amen. Amen. Anything yeah, else? It says here in Romans, here in Romans uh, 6, uh, in relation to Brother Ben, uh -huh. it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law, Ah, hold on, it's not wrong. Verse 6, mm -hmm. for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Mm -hmm. So, Ben is correct. That spirituality is... <laughs> That's... Yeah. Now you have a reference, Ben. <laughs> yeah, it's in Romans 8. Six. Romans 8. Six. Yeah, it's spiritual... Yeah. Spirituality minded is life and peace. So, you know, and righteousness is a different. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Our spirit, now it's not spiritually minded, but more spirit, right? Sure. And you're of the spirit, yeah. Which is, uh, which is still part of the righteousness that comes by faith. Okay, so next week, you know what? Yeah, next week we we continue with verse uh, with chapter twenty one. Now we are getting closer to uh, reaching the promised land. Of course, that will last forty years for the Is Israelites, but it will last us only a few chapters. And uh, there's a lot more to learn. We will learn about Balaam. We will learn about the kings that they conquered along the way. And, uh, of course, the transfer of leadership to Joshua. And also, okay. we're finishing the book of James by Pastor Tiffany. Uh -huh. Every message, and it's a good, you know, uh, yes. message. It's really a reminder. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, re we referred to it uh, at least two or three times in this uh, deep dive. So, mm -hmm. very good lessons. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, once more, Lord, we, we thank you because your spirit leads us into all truth. Um, as we uh, continue our deep dive into your word, we begin to see how patient and tedious the spirit has worked to make sure that the words that get into scripture actually reveal what you want to reveal. And that uh, you also painstakingly removed any possible distortion to the understanding of your word. Thank you because we are recipients of such grace, of such effort from your spirit. Amen. To, um, to make us understand you more. Thank you because uh, 
Um, you did it out of your great love for us. Thank now, you. Lord, that we have learned these precious lessons, may we continue to live by faith. If we're not there yet, Lord, teach us to live by faith. Faith in the finished work of Christ and faith in the fact that uh, he gave us resurrection power through the Holy Spirit to be able to live an abundant life free from the power of sin. The Lord, mm -hmm. we ask in Jesus' name that uh, for your people who are here today, give us that grace, us Lord, that grace to live according to, live according. to what to the principles that you have taught us today. And may your spirit, as you promised, bring to remembrance yes, Lord, everything else perfection. that we have learned. Yes, God. We want to please you with our lives mm -hmm. and continue to give us a fresh supply of the water of life Amen. so that we can obey accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.